I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but I'm kind of obsessed with not being interested in fashion. It's uh, something I care deeply not about. And I'm aware that not being into fashion is a fashion choice, right? How annoying is that? It's like, oh, you're not into fashion? That means you're in norm core. Why can't I just wear clothes to cover my disgusting body? <laughs> Why must it be a choice? Because the only choice I make when it comes to clothing is, does it still fit me? <laughs> I don't know if you've had an opportunity to fat out of clothes. <laughs> That's a special feeling. <laughs> watershed moments in your life, right? When you hold your newborn child or you fat out of a t-shirt. It's amazing because you don't even go to the obvious conclusion. You're like, well, this sure used to fit. I haven't grown since I was a teenager. Oh, I'm a fat ass. Well, time for a burrito. I don't know. The best is when you pack for a trip and you fat out of clothes, but you don't realize until you get there. <laughs> you sit there and you go, well, I guess I could wear that as long as I don't breathe out. <laughs> or sit down. You ever wear a shirt you can't sit down in? Yeah, you know what, I'm gonna stand. I know it's Thanksgiving, I'm more thankful standing. <laughs> Better angle for carving. I still have all the clothes that don't fit me. They're in my closet in case I have a dramatic weight loss over a weekend. It's ridiculous. It's like I'm curating an exhibit of my weight gain. Well, that suit was from 30 pounds ago, and that sweater was from last winter, and this shirt, this shirt never fit. Have you done that? Have you bought clothes that don't fit, thinking that'll be the incentive to lose weight? It's like, well, I've only gained weight for the last 40 years. Maybe this shirt will turn it around. How'd you lose weight? I bought a shirt. It worked. No, fashion's kind of wasted on me. You know, like those fashion shows? To me, fashion shows just look like skinny teenagers walking around in their parents' clothes looking for food. <laughs> wow, there's no food out there. All right, I'll change my outfit and look again. Fashion shows are rather absurd when you consider they're just people sitting around watching people walk around in clothes, which is what people do in clothes every day. But at fashion shows, they're f so fascinated, they're like, oh my gosh, oh wow, look at that person walking close. How do they do it? Oh, if only we could watch them do laundry. And we all know what a fashion show is, because we've seen it on TV. In December, they televised the Victoria's Secret fashion show, which is excellent, by the way. <laughs> well, that one's different, because there's angels, so there's a spiritual aspect <laughs> to the thongs they're peddling. It's interesting, all the models are beautiful. You ever notice that? You're like, yeah, Jim, that's the point. <laughs> no, but all the models, they pick people that would look good in any clothing. Like, if you want me to buy a suit, show me Michael Moore looking good in it. <laughs> and I'm not picking on Michael Moore. I'm friends with him. I like Michael Moore. And not just because he proves you don't need to shower to be famous. <laughs> you ever see Michael Moore on television? He looks like he's been robbed of everything he owns. <laughs> Are you the victim of a shipwreck? <laughs> what happened? Pull it together. You won an Academy Award. Stop shopping at the Lost and Found. But I understand Michael Moore's mentality. Fashion's not going to change his life. It's not going to change my life. I look the same whether I'm wearing a T-shirt or a tux. I still look like someone who eats fast food. Probably because I do eat fast food. I look the way I look. Look, I didn't vote for Trump, but I walked around New York City and everyone the week after the election looked at me like, you did it. <laughs> you did it. And I was like, I didn't do it. <laughs> but after a couple days, I was like, did I do it? <laughs>
try to be a good dad. I got my kids a dog. I rescued a dog. Thank you. Thank you. I, well, it's not like the dog was drowning. The dog wasn't a victim of sex trafficking. I just went in a building, gave a guy money, and got a dog. That's how I rescued it. After that, I rescued a pizza. I actually... I had to wait to rescue the dog because the dog was in Jamaica. I don't know if it was on vacation. But I rescued a dog from paradise so it could live in my crowded New York City apartment. Sometimes I put the leash on the dog and it looks at me like, I used to run on the beach. And now I sleep in a cage. My only hope is that one day you'll get rescued. But rescue is the language of today, right? And we mean adoption. Now, people don't even say they own dogs. Now people say they're a dog parent. But I feel like dogs are different from kids. Like, you, you never hear a parent say, you know, my son had some behavior problems, so we gave him to a friend who had a farm upstate. <laughs> and we can run around and we'll visit him on weekends. <laughs> Jim, you're a monster. It's nice to have a partner, someone looking out for you, you look out for them. Like I did two weeks of shows out of town in December, and when I came home, my wife informed me that she made me an appointment for the gastroenterologist. <laughs> if you're unfamiliar, that's the doctor that sticks the camera up your butt. I mean, they do other things, but that's what they're famous for. <laughs> that's probably how they attract people to the field. You like photography? Job, you're gonna love. <laughs> I didn't ask my wife to set up this appointment. I wasn't sick, I didn't have any symptoms. She just did it because she was looking out for me. So she casually brought it up. She goes, just so you know, I made you an appointment for the gastroenterologist. And I said, just so you know, I won't be going. <laughs> she was like, why wouldn't you go? It's just a consultation. I said, well, it's the principal. I'm an adult, I make my own decisions. Thank you. Anyway, so I'm at the gastroenterologist. <laughs> The doctor starts to describe the procedure, and I said, look, I should probably let you know, I don't really enjoy getting my picture taken. <laughs> I would be open to an ultrasound. I think a lot of men are curious what the jelly on the belly feels like. <laughs> anyway, the doctor, he didn't think it was funny. <laughs> and I knew it was precautionary, so I agreed. So he went over to his computer and he goes, all right, my next available appointment is in three months. And I was like, three months? This was in December. I didn't know if I wanted this procedure hang over my head during the holidays. Jim, you want another piece of pie? No, I'm getting a camera up my butt. I don't want some team of doctors to be like, wow, this guy loves pie. Mary, get out here. He's got a half a pie up there. I didn't know what could delay this important procedure. But part of me didn't want to find out. I didn't want the doctor to be like, well, the real delay is finding someone to clean the camera. That takes a <laughs> Turnover in that position's insane. You know, people do it once and they're like, you know what, I'm going back on food stamps. <laughs> then I was thinking, maybe it's the doctor. Maybe he's like, dude, I can only do this procedure once a month. <laughs> then I gotta take a week off, sit on the beach, and ask myself why I keep sticking cameras up people's butts. <laughs> I could have been a dentist. <laughs> Again with the dental reference. <laughs> but in February, I had the procedure, and I think every man in here should get a colonoscopy, because I had to. <laughs> it's not an easy decision, because the best news you can find out from getting a camera stuck up your butt is learning you didn't need to have a camera stuck up your butt. <laughs> That's the best news. Yeah, we didn't need to do that. <laughs> We can just chalk that up, one for fun. <laughs> and the day before the procedure, you can't eat anything, and I'm a total pig, so I was terrified. But after I was awake for five hours and I hadn't eaten anything, I wasn't hungry. I was suicidal. <laughs> I was so bored. I was like, what am I supposed to sit here and feel feelings? And then at noon and at 6 p.m., you have to drink this serum that I believe is made by a collaboration of x lax and Taco Bell. <laughs> Printed on the side of the serum, it should have just said, drink this in the bathroom. <laughs> Might want to grab a pillow and a book. Because I tell you, I've had diarrhea before. 
is the point where everyone acts like they've never had diarrhea. I don't even know what Jim's talking about, do you? Yeah, I'm the only one who's had diarrhea in a hotel hot tub. Okay. Like we're at the same hotel. No, I've had diarrhea. I don't want to brag. No, I've had diarrhea, but calling what this serum did to my body diarrhea is an insult to the word diarrhea. My body made noises I didn't know existed. At one point, I thought I stepped on a puppy. I was in the bathroom for hours, for hours, checking email, ignoring phone calls. Because serum or not, you can't answer the phone in the bathroom because you can't hide the fact you're in the bathroom because there's an echo. Are, are you in a well? Yes, yes, I'm down here in a well. Just no kids in this well, making sure no kids fell in. But I kept getting this call from the doctor's office and I thought there might be important information like someone saying, do not drink the serum. <laughs> so I answered it and it was just someone confirming the appointment. And I don't know how someone's supposed to sound when they confirm a colonoscopy, but this person was really casual. They're like, hey, how are you? So we're we gonna see you tomorrow. What are we having brunch? I thought I was getting a camera up my butt. She gave me the address. The next morning I went there. It wasn't at a hospital or a clinic. It was at some building. Just picture where you imagine the black market would harvest human organs. <laughs> what am I doing here? And I took an elevator to the basement. There was this huge space with all these makeshift rooms with shower curtains. And I was led into one. There was all this talking. You know when you're nervous and you think you hear things? I thought I heard someone go, I can't believe he's here. <laughs> I want his kidney. And I was terrified. And then eventually an anesthesiologist walked in. He gave me a shot and he goes, I just want to go through what's going to happen. Right now I'm giving you some medicine which will knock you out. And when you wake up, you won't remember anything. You okay with that? <laughs> and against every instinct in my body, I just went, okay. <laughs> and the last memory I had is just watching the anesthesiologist leave the room as I heard someone go, I want a spleen. <laughs> And I woke up and I was fine. I mean, I'm pregnant, but I'm fine. <laughs> Did some shows in China, all in Chinese. Picked it up at the Y. <laughs> it's not that hard. It wasn't that complicated. You visit some places and you think, all right, there's a language barrier, but I could get by. In China, I was like, oh, if I got lost, I would die here. <laughs> I wouldn't last a half a day. Everyone's looking at me like I'm a ghost anyway. <laughs> The Chinese were very nice. They were fascinated with my pale blonde children. Many of them wanted pictures with my kids. They didn't really ask, they just grabbed a kid. <laughs> Can I have a picture with this one? I guess you're gonna. <laughs> and when they were done with the picture, they would rub my blonde kid's head. Cause you know, they're my kids, but they're also lucky objects. <laughs> and after this happened a couple times, I was like, hey, we should charge, right? <laughs> China was fascinating and exhausting. I brought my kids to the Great Wall. We saw the terracotta warriors. We walked through the Forbidden City. We rode in a rickshaw. And when we were leaving, I asked my five-year-old, I said, what was your favorite part of China? And he said, I like that time we saw the truck with the pigs on it. Because <laughs> at one point we were stuck in traffic and this truck pulled up and it had pigs in cages. And that was his favorite part. <laughs> after the 15-hour flight. <laughs> and I remember when that truck pulled up, because I remember looking at those pigs and feeling sorry for them, but those pigs looked happy. They were, it was almost like the pigs were looking at me and my five screaming kids going, well, at least we're not that slob. <laughs> I do enjoy traveling to other countries, seeing how different, but essentially similar we all are. Like, like the UK is not that different from the US. You know, if anything, you go over there and it seems like British people are trying to be different from Americans. They're like, oh, you drive on the right side of the road, then, then we're gonna drive on the left side of the road. <laughs> oh, you call your mother mom, then we're gonna call ours mum. <laughs> oh, you call that a cookie, then we're not going to the dentist. <laughs> I know that's cheap. I 
did notice something when I was over there. You know, British people, they don't say the before hospital. You ever notice that? They're like, hospital? I was feeling knackered, so I went to hospital. <laughs> Whenever they would do that, I'd say, stop that, that's wrong and weird. <laughs> Are you trying to sound like a polite caveman? <laughs> and I had a friend from London, he was like, what makes you think you're doing it properly? And I go, because I'm American and we invented the English language. <laughs> It was a pet peeve of mine, so I did some research. You know why British people don't say the before hospital? Because they're dicks. <laughs> yeah! I know that sounds harsh, but admit it, British people always talk to Americans like we just walked into their jewelry store with two full bags of garbage. <laughs> uh, may I help you? <laughs> Are you lost? Obviously, I love the Brits, and I would never do those jokes there. <laughs> I have been lucky enough to perform in the UK a couple times, and one time I was walking through Piccadilly Circus, which, for the record, is a horrible circus. <laughs> There's no animals. And no, I was walking through Piccadilly Circus, and I saw they had an M&M store. And I looked at that M&M store, and it just made me think of all the things the British have given the Americans. Like, our language, Shakespeare, the Magna Carta. And I looked at the M&M store and I thought, now we're even. <laughs> when I looked at the M&M store, I wasn't even embarrassed to be American. I was ashamed to be human. Because <laughs> has anyone at any point in their life thought, when are they gonna open an M&M store? <laughs> sure, I can buy M&Ms absolutely anywhere but I like to buy in bulk, <laughs> in a pro m and &M environment. <laughs> Obviously, we don't need an m and &M store. We don't even need different colored M&Ms. <laughs> they all taste the same. They're just bits of chocolate shaped like Advil. <laughs> with an M on it. They're not even M&Ms, they're M's. <laughs> we don't do that with anything else. You want some raisin and raisins? Go ahead. Grab a handful of raisin and raisins. <laughs> no, I don't even know how many M&Ms or M's they would have to sell in London to justify Piccadilly Circus real estate, but this M&M store is massive in the UK. It is three levels, which I guess makes sense, because the first level, so you can buy M&Ms. The second level, so you can buy more M&Ms. <laughs> and then the third level, so you can jump to your death. <laughs> because you wasted time in an M&M store <laughs> when you were in London. <laughs> By the way, I don't have any judgment. If you personally enjoy going to the M&M store, that's fine, but obviously you shouldn't vote. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what type of massage I'm getting when I get a massage. Like, Do you want a deep tissue, a shiatsu, or a Swedish massage? I'm like, I'll take the blonde. I don't know. <laughs> Because men view massages differently. A woman gets a massage, her friends are like, good for you. A guy gets a massage, you dirty dog! Because <laughs> men sexualize all human interaction. <laughs> it was a therapeutic massage. How therapeutic? <laughs> Nothing happened. Yeah, that's what we'll tell your wife, huh? <laughs> that's gotta be frustrating for massage therapists, that double meaning. Did you get a massage or a massage? <laughs> no other occupation has to deal with it. Did you get a cavity filled or a cavity filled? <laughs> How many dentistry references is he gonna have? <laughs> For me, a massage is just an hour of awkwardness, right? She, she gets done, she leaves the room, I put on the robe, I step outside, she hands me a glass of water. I was looking at her and go, you're never gonna call me. <laughs> What a charade. <laughs> I did have one massage therapist. She told me they're allowed to turn people down. I don't know why she told me that. <laughs> it was after a show. Can you imagine getting turned down by a massage therapist? That's rough. Yeah, you couldn't pay me to touch it. <laughs> Not for all the money on the planet. <laughs> Massages, that's how some people relax. Some people relax in a hot sauna. And sure, who doesn't love recreating the feeling of being trapped inside an active volcano? <laughs> I don't 
understand the appeal of a sauna. Here's every experience I've had in a sauna. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get a sweat going. It's gonna be really good for me. Here we go, it's time to get out, right? <laughs> I don't wanna overdo it. What is so relaxing about sitting in a hot box next to a pile of smoldering rocks? I always look at the rocks like, whoever's cooking the rocks, they're done. <laughs> That's a wrap on the rock cooking. And to make this sauna more enjoyable, you're always seated next to a naked 80-year-old man. <laughs> oh, good, I get to sweat next to someone's grandpa who's only wearing a hand towel. <laughs> the nudity in this sauna seems unnecessary. This isn't Rome. <laughs> I just look around the sauna like, wow, so this is why we wear clothes, huh? <laughs> so we may eventually eat. In Finland, in Finland, where they invented the sauna, they relax in Finland by drinking vodka in the sauna, which might explain why we've never read any Finnish literature. <laughs> vodka in the sauna. Actually, the Finns, they pronounce it sauna, because they're wasted. <laughs> you know, I go to sauna and drink some vodka. Drinking vodka in a sauna? You know what kind of ideas you come up with? An M&M store. <laughs>
I joke around, but it was scary. We have five children. And there were moments when I was like, oh my gosh, if anything happens to my wife, those five kids are gonna be put up for adoption. <laughs> Some of these jokes are just for the fathers. When I'm home in New York City, I work out at the Chinatown YMCA, and I realize when people hear the Chinatown YMCA, they think, oh, that's not like a serious place to work out, and it's not. <laughs> it's not at all. It's mostly little kids learning how to swim and really old Chinese people with their parents. <laughs> I didn't even know you could live to that age. But I tell you, watching a 90-year-old on an elliptical really inspires me to die in my 70s. <laughs> it looks like a machine is eating someone's grandma. But I love my why. You know, it's, it's different from a normal health club. There's never moments when you think, oh my gosh, look at how much weight that guy's lifting. It's more like, oh my gosh, that guy's smoking. <laughs> on a treadmill. In dress pants. It's very business casual. <laughs> sure, my Y doesn't have some of the amenities, but it also doesn't have the normal health club distractions. I don't have to deal with loud music or people that are in shape. <laughs> I walk around my Y and I'm like, you know what, I'm doing okay. Maybe I should teach a class. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Advanced Elliptical. Doesn't matter if you don't have workout clothes on, we're not gonna be raising our heart rate. <laughs> So let's step on, pick a show, and think about what we're gonna eat. Okay. <laughs> Who's having a burger, huh? Let's practice eating fries. <laughs> I'm ignored at my why. I'm ignored at all health clubs. Like when I walk into a fitness area, even in a hotel, people always look at me like, I didn't know they serve food here. <laughs> the only people that approach me are, are personal trainers. They're like, you looking for a personal trainer? Uh, no. You should be. <laughs> so I've gotten to the point, if I'm approached by a personal trainer, I just act like they're hitting on me. They're like, hey, how you doing? I'm married. <laughs> uh, I don't think you understand. I understand perfectly. <laughs> you want to get with me, but I'm taken, so you can look, but no touchy. <laughs> oh, I did one of those genetic tests. I was surprised to find out I'm all Asian. You do learn things from those genetic tests. Like, I discovered I wasted a hundred bucks. <laughs> they send you information. Mine just said, dude, you're white. In fact, you're very white. I hope you feel guilty. <laughs> they didn't even break out my nationality. They just highlighted all the British Isles. They're like, you're trash from here. <laughs> Wherever people need sunscreen. <laughs> expect to learn from these genetic tests like oh my gosh I'm related to my ancestors <laughs> we're only gonna find out bad news you see it in the commercials I thought I was Italian but it ends up my great-grandma was a whore <laughs> so I guess I'm Eastern European <laughs> sometimes people think I'm saying Eastern Europeans are whores and I am no. <laughs> My point is, only good family news is passed along. Like, if your great-grandfather was Abraham Lincoln, you'd already know that. But if your great-grandfather was the town drunk, your grandpa's likely to go, uh, I don't remember. I think he worked in a bar. Chief gutter inspector. I do know I have some Irish ancestry, but apparently the Irish didn't keep great records because, well, draw your own conclusion. <laughs> some tells me they weren't busy sunbathing. <laughs> I'm Irish, but I have blonde hair. Supposedly the only reason the Irish have blonde or red hair is because the Vikings invaded, pillaged, and probably other stuff. <laughs> Those Vikings, the Scandinavians, I don't know if you've been to Sweden, it's like a whole country of Scarlett Johansson's. <laughs> if I was in Ireland at that time, I would have been, oh no, some Viking lady's coming to pillage me. I guess I'll hide on this bed covered in rose petals. <laughs> Hopefully she can help me put together that table. <laughs> <laughs>